Our lesson this morning comes from the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, the first eight verses, and then verses 16 and 17. Hear these words, Jesus speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I am them bear much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands that you may love one another. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Growing up, I hated that passage of Scripture, loathed it because of what a preacher did one Sunday in church. In the church of my baptism, I was in charge of the balcony. That's where the youth group sat, and we stayed in trouble in the balcony. It was so ancient in that church, we actually had to pass notes to each other to communicate. Yes, those were the good old days. We sat as far away from the pulpit as we could sit. We figured the preacher couldn't see us. Boy, were we wrong. Anyway, the pastor was preaching one Sunday on this passage. And I actually listened to sermons then. And I'm leaning in. I'm the vine. My father's the vine grower. Oh, this sounds good. But then he got to the part with lopping shears. Every branch that doesn't bear fruit, I lop off. And if you're a rotten branch, I break you off. And then he proceeded to hold us over hell like a weenie. Burn, baby, burn. And all this stuff that's been lopped off and all this stuff that's been torn off, I'm going to throw into the fires of hell. And the preacher at that point raised his bony finger and says, I know what you youth were doing last night. You were out sowing your wild oats, and you're in church this morning praying for a crop failure. I completely missed the analogy he put out there. I know that I had been doing nothing evil that night. I mean, on Saturday night, that particular Saturday night, we had gone downtown and gotten the S&H Green Stamps sign from in front of the Western Auto. You remember those signs, we give green stamps? check with an old person later on, find out what green stamps are. And we took the s &H green stamp sign from in front of the Western Auto and we put it in front of Gunthorpe Funeral Home. <laughs> we give green stamps. That's all we did. But you young people are not being fruitful. You're not bearing fruit. God's going to cut you off, break you off. And you're going to burn in hell. So I've avoided the 15th chapter of John for a long time. Because trust me, that impacted my soul. But then I read it. Every branch that bears fruit, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. And I thought, wait a minute. It's about the vine, and it's about bearing fruit. It's not about lopping shears. It's not about God breaking you off and discarding you. It's about bearing fruit. And I thought about this theologically. Okay, 
What fruit comes from a grapevine? Grapes. What can you do with grapes? Well, you can pick the grapes and eat the grapes. Good grapes. Or you can let your grapes sit around and shrink up. Learned this from the confirmation class this morning. The confirmation class was correcting the preacher's sermon at confirmation class. They're smart kids. You can let the grape kind of shrivel up and it becomes a raisin. Raisins are good. Or you can take your grape, if your grandmother left you the recipe, and you can make grape jelly or grape jam. There's only one flavor of grape jelly, Bama grape jelly. Okay, Welch's. Who doesn't love a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Who doesn't love a little grape jelly on their toast in the morning? Or you can let that grape hang around and ferment. And then you have wine. One night I was preaching and I was kind of being dug, which you've about figured out what that is. There is no bridle on my mouth. And I was preaching about Wine. This lady right over here in the middle of my sermon raised her hand. Preacher, you're wrong. In Bible times, the wine was not fermented. It was just grape juice. And I thought, you know, that's an interesting thing. You can put the pour the wine in a bladder of a camel, tie it up, drive across the desert, and it's not going to ferment. No. Here's what the Bible says about that. There's a man in the Old Testament, his name is Noah. You may have heard of him. Noah, he built him, he built him an arky arky. Trying to see if you know the words. Noah, a man of the soil. This is after the flood, after they've landed, after the covenant. Noah, a man of the of soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. Noah, go for it. And then you know what he did next after he planted the vineyard? He fermented those suckers because the next verse says, and he drank some of the wine and became snockered. You cannot get snockered on Welch's grape juice, although we've got some in the refrigerator in the church office that I may have to use next communion Sunday. It's looking a little brisk. John 15 is about Jesus as the vine, but John 15 is about the fruit of the vine, which are grapes. And what do you make out of grapes according to the Bible? Wine. This is not going to be a temperance sermon. However, I don't want to stop there because wine is a symbol of joy. Wine is a symbol of joy. The psalmist put it this way. You cause the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for people to use and bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart. It says it right there. The 104th Psalm, verse 15, and wine to what? Gladden the heart. Don't tell the church of my baptism that's in there. It gets better. Isaiah, 25th chapter, listen to this one. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich foods. It does not say low calorie. It does not say low fat. It does not say healthy or good for you. It says a feast of rich foods and a feast of well-aged wines. God's going to pull out the good stuff out of the wine cellar. Isaiah goes on. A feast of rich food filled with marrow 
and well-aged wine strained clear. There's nothing in this wine but pure wine. It gets better. Chris is preaching next Sunday. It's not his Sunday to preach. We just wanted to warm him up because he's going to be gone on the fourth Sunday. So I'm going to preach on the third Sunday. And he's preaching from John, the second chapter. You know what's famous about John, the second chapter? You know what Jesus did? His very first miracle, miracle number one, Jesus turned water into wine. A hundred, between 150 and 180 gallons, depending on how Chris um, how many gallons he's got in the ceremonial jars. You'll have to come Sunday to see what Chris is going to say. And he's wondering how much of my, his sermon I'm going to preach right now. Yeah. Yeah. The wedding feast had run out of wine. The joy was gone. Jesus is saying official Judaism with all its rules and regulations has stripped loving God of any joy, of anything of the heart. And I as Messiah have come to bring joy back to living. I've come to bring a Abundant, wonderful, wine-filled joy. As a matter of fact, in the wedding feast back then, what they would do is they would serve the good wine first, and after all the people had gotten good and drunk, then they would bring out the Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill. And Jesus did it so well, the, the, the wine steward said, wait a minute, you've kept the good stuff to last. Jesus brings joy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundant. I've come that they may have joy. Jesus even tells us that in heaven there is great joy over one sinner that repents. Can you imagine the angels holding up wine glasses, clinking them together when one sinner repents? You better. The Bible says there's laughter in heaven. There's joy in heaven. Brother Doug... It was time change last night. They stole an hour of sleep from us. We don't feel joyous. You need to. Jesus brings us joy. Did I leave you enough sermon to preach? Okay, I left you enough. You want me to go do anything else? I can really fix it where you've got to do a whole new exegesis. Wine becomes a symbol of joy. Joy is the hallmark of the church. If you want to become a growing, dynamic, spirit-filled church that attracts people, you become a church that's joy-filled. You know, you, you, I've been in too many churches, and I think you have too, that they got baptized in alum. They're just, the only spiritual gift they have is the gift of pucker. Not so with you. John 15 is about fruit. It's about bearing fruit. It's about bringing joy. And why does he prune us so we can bear more fruit? Four things I want to say about joy. There is joy in abiding. Jesus said, look, this is all about abiding. You abide in the vine. The vine feeds you. I am that vine. Abide in me as I abide in you. We're called to abide in Christ. The Greek word for joy and the Greek word for grace are cousin words. Kara is joy. Charis is grace. You can't have grace without having joy and you can't have joy without having grace because some mornings I wake up and I don't feel joyous, but I have the grace of God in Jesus Christ. I have his prevenient grace, his justifying grace, his sanctifying grace, and one day I'll go to heaven and I'll have his glorifying grace. You didn't know Methodist had four graces, but we do. The world of a Methodist is the world of, that talks about grace, God extending his unmerited, undeserved, unearned, you can't work for it, grace, just because he loves us. And when we're abiding in Jesus Christ, when our lives are filled with Christ, when we're walking with Christ, when we're spending time on our knees before Christ in prayer, in fellowship, as Christ dwells in us and we dwell in him, we don't have to produce the fruit. He produces the fruit through us. We become vehicles of his grace. 
But it only works as we're abiding in Christ. There's joy in tending. What I've learned about John 15 is all that pruning that was going on that I was so worried about. And you know, I read John 15 out of growing up playing high school football. And I don't know if you played high school football. But you'd play the game on Friday night. And in our football team's tradition, win, lose, or draw on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, you had to be back at the stadium. And there the coach was with his 16-millimeter projector in the game film from the night before. And he had that infernal clicker. Play would go forward, play would back up. Play would go forward, play would back up. And he would sit there, and one Saturday morning he said, DeGraff and Reed, what were you thinking, son? You threw that football, you threw it into triple coverage. What were you thinking, son? I completed the pass, coach. What were you thinking, son? He would just mess you up. And I always took this that... John 15 is kind of like Jesus is up in heaven running the clicker. Doug, what were you thinking right there? You didn't lead that person to Christ. What were you doing? That's not it. These aren't words of judgment. They're words of grace. They're words of, these are words of love? Yeah. These are words of love. We have joy when we tend the vine. When we tend the vine, when we tend our branches, when we prune ourselves, nobody's pruning us, we're pruning ourselves. As you spend time with your spiritual disciplines, as you spend time in prayer, as you spend time in small groups, as you spend time sharing Christ with a friend, as you hold each other accountable for your Christian faith and your Christian walk, you're tending the vine. And what happens is you're pruning around, pruning out the stuff that you don't need in your life because the Holy Spirit Spirit works on you. The Holy Spirit shows you that which gives you godliness, that which grows you in joy, and that which is keeping you from joy. Being a vine tender is not an act of willpower, but a spontaneous emotional response of the heart. I want to be more and more like Jesus. That's my goal. I want to be more and more like Jesus. The color of the hair on the top of my head sets. I'm getting closer and closer to meeting Jesus. I want to be more and more like Jesus. I don't want to surprise Jesus when I get there. Who are you? I want to become Christ-like in my deportment, in everything I do. So I tend the vine, and you can too, through prayer, Bible study, um, small groups, just having a Christian friend that calls you and holds you accountable. So there's joy in abiding, there's joy in tending, there's joy in serving. John Wesley, when he was a student at Oxford, had an encounter with a poor porter who came by his house one night. The man came to talk to Wesley about faith. Wesley observed the man's tattered coat and suggested that he needed to wear a warmer one. And the man said, sir, this is the only coat I have, and I thank God for it. Looking at the man closely, Wesley said, sir, have you eaten today? And the man said, I've had one glass of water, but I thank God for it. Now feeling uncomfortable in the man's presence, Wesley said, sir, it'll soon be past the time when you can get into your apartment. What then will you thank God for? And the man said, I will thank him that I have dry stones upon which to lay my head. Wesley was moved by the man's sincerity and asked, you thank God when you have nothing to wear, nothing to eat, no bed to lie on. What else do you thank him for? And the man said, I thank God that he's given me a life a heart to love, and a desire to serve him. The man left that night with a coat from Wesley's closet, money for food, and words of appreciation for his witness. Wesley would later write in his journal, he convinced me there is something in religion to which I am a stranger. There's joy in serving others. March 26th is our second serve day, and you need to know the serve day came from one of you. It's a layperson's idea. We're just 
getting out of the way and letting the Holy Spirit work. Um, there are two ramps being built in Jonesboro, two ramps being built in Jonesboro. So if you have the gift of power tool, you can go to Jonesboro and build ramps. It's a cool thing to do. We're going to paint one. Okay, two ramps being built. See, my sermon's so fresh, I'm interacting right now. People want to know when I write my sermons, and I say, while I'm preaching them. What do you think I do during the offertory? But another thing going on serve day is we're going to help people at the laundry mat. We're going to load up our quarters and hang out at the laundry mat and pay for people to do their laundry. Hmm. So this idea came up and, and the... They agreed to do it. And Marie was telling me about this the other day. What happened was we discovered that on Saturdays, which we're going to do, the laundromats are primarily filled with Hispanic folks. Now, my Spanish is limited. I know cerveza, baño, una mas por favor. That's it. So I wouldn't be good with the laundry especially with a group of Hispanic people. Adrian Smith said, well, okay, we're going to have Spanish people. Let's talk to Lindsay Hurd. She, she teaches Spanish. Lindsay said, I've got a better idea. Armando, you know Armando? Tacos de Guero, you know Armando, yes. He's come to Chris's Bible study a couple of times. He, he pastors his own Hispanic church. Let's ask him. And he can come and bring his church. Guess what Armando's church has been talking about? How to get involved in the community and discover who's out there. And Marie's telling me this story about two congregations coming together. And I got Holy Spirit goosebumps going up and down my arm thinking, God, you're going to show up. Something really cool is going to happen. And we're going to bring joy to other people. Doing laundry. You didn't know you could find joy doing laundry, did you? We need ramp builders, but if you really want to watch the Holy Spirit work, choose laundry. Because something's going to happen because we find joy in serving one another. So we find joy in abiding, joy in tending the vine, joy in serving others, and we find joy in encouragement. Joy in encouragement. I hope you have an encourager in your life, somebody that checks on you, somebody that lifts you up, somebody that affirms you, somebody that's giving you an attaboy or an girl. Somebody that lets you know they're praying for you. It is a wonderful thing to have uh, people who encourage you. I was sitting at the Parsonage on a Thursday night. Parsonage is located on 1219 Roosevelt Boulevard in Kenner, Louisiana. The phone rang. It was appointment season, and the voice on the other end of the phone said, Doug DeGraffenry, this is Dr. Doug McGuire. I said, yes, sir, Dr. McGuire. He said, I'm serving as the interim district superintendent of the Ruston District. Yes, sir. He said, how would you feel about going and pastoring my family? I said, which church is that? He said, we want you to go to First Methodist Church Arcadia. He, he talked about growing up at that church and oh, how much he loved the people in Arcadia. And I said, Doug, I'd, I'd love to go pastor that church and it started a wonderful relationship. Uh, Tamara and I had a great time in Arcadia. We got married in Arcadia. We got married uh, on December 16th because the church was already decorated for Christmas. And I was cheap. She married me anyway. Anyway, we spent five years at that church and the weirdest thing happened. And I didn't catch on to it until the last year I was there. Sometimes preachers have bad weeks. Sometimes Methodists like to beat on preachers. Just, you know, they like to share in love. Preacher, I'm coming to share in love. 
Those Lenten seats, they're not comfortable. I know. You change some things. I know. We think you ought to. I know. Just flail away on you. Every time I had a week like that, and I didn't have many, but I had a few. On Friday of that week, Doug McGuire would show up at the church office. And he would say, well, I just happened to be in town to get a haircut. Now, Doug McGuire is one of the former pastors of this church. And Doug McGuire has nothing on top of his head. I mean, nothing. It's chrome dome up there. And all he was having the barber do was to polish him to a high gloss. Every time I had a bad week, there was Doug McGuire not talking about what had happened, not quizzing me about anything, but saying, I'm praying for you. What can I do for you? I want to support you. I love these people. You're going to love them too. What a gift. I'd be having the worst week in the history of weeks. And after spending 30 minutes with Doug McGuire, I was ready to go get them again. Do you have somebody in your life like that that encourages you? More importantly, do you encourage other people? How many people just need a word of encouragement? I'm praying for you. I'm thinking about you. Is there anything I can do to help? I'm here to listen. Man, there are folks that are dealing with stuff. It's either theirs or their parents. There, there are dreams that haven't happened. There are, there are families that are falling apart. There, there are people that are just feeling alone. They're feeling estranged from the community. Bring them joy. Encourage them. So John 15 is about the vine. Jesus said, I am the vine. Stay connected to me and you will experience joy. Abide in me, you will experience joy. Tend to your spiritual life and you'll experience joy. Serve others, you'll experience joy. And encourage and be encouraged. And you'll experience joy. Would you stand and pray with me? We pray, O oh God, that the joy of Jesus Christ would be ours, that his love and his grace would flow through us and flow to others so that others might see Christ in us. Fill us with the joy of the Holy Spirit is our prayer in your name. Amen.